But I mean, REITs, I mean, it, it does get into some high finance like semantics when you're looking through earnings reports and looking through the businesses. Like where would you sit, think is a good uh, place to start if you were going to evaluate the various REITs in the cannabis space? Hey, everyone. Welcome to our latest TDR Cannabis Exclusive. Hope you had a great weekend as we start the new week. Some interesting announcements pertaining to dividends in this industry. And one of the main focuses on our podcast today is understanding how the real estate model is going to progress if indeed we see reform, which is why we have our next guest into our podcast. He is the CEO of New Lake Capital Partners, which trades under the under the OTC, under the ticker symbol NLCP, Anthony Cogniglio. Good to see you, sir. How are things? Good to see you. Things are great. Thanks for having me. Excited yeah. for our conversation. I know. You've been uh, taking part in a lot of our Twitter space and some of our live streams. Uh, you're very well known within this space, but what do you make of like the uh, direction of this uh, industry over the last few weeks? A uh, lot of excitement, needless to say. It's, it's terrific to see this momentum, a real shot in the arm to an industry that's kind of suffered through the last 12 months or so with some yeah. negative press, some yeah. false starts uh, around legislation. So it's great to see the momentum. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, as I said off the top, Anthony Verrill, good to see you too. Hope your dolphins look pretty good last night too, huh, buddy? I got no complaints. <laughs> I've got no complaints. They, they look like the best team in football. I'm not going to get too ahead of myself, but I'll go there. All right. Bragging it to say the least. But as I said, Anthony, off the top, we've seen this, you know, shot in the arm resurgence within the industry. Uh, still a lot of like questions that need to be answered. But if we do see reform, if there's one thing that you can point out as to how the real estate model is going to stem to benefit from that, what would it be? Yeah, well, I think it's growth. It all comes down to growth. This industry needs a significant amount of infrastructure to realize its true potential. And a lot of that infrastructure is for real estate. And so while most of the operators have shelved a lot of their CapEx and a lot of the physical expansion of their businesses, appropriately so after the, over the last 12 months, we think that if we do get rescheduling, if we do get safe banking, that you're going to see an industry that will resume that very rapid growth trajectory and real estate will be a key yeah. part of that. Yeah, 100%. So let's focus, um, as I said off the top, your CEO of New Lake Capital, your real estate investment trust, otherwise known as REIT, provides capital and state licensed cannabis operators through a three-pronged revenue generation approach. So can you could explain how that three-pronged revenue approach works? Yes, yes. You know, first I just say our business model is quite simple. We purchase properties from and for state licensed cannabis operators, and we lease them out on a long-term basis. And so we get to collect rent over the 15 to 20 years of the term of that lease, and in turn pay a dividend to our shareholders. And we've been paying dividends to our shareholders since the inception of the company and since we went public in August of 21. In terms of the three ways we acquire those properties, one is where we acquire an already existing and operational property from an operator, and we lease it back to them immediately upon the purchase. And that provides them the ability to free up and raise non-dilutive capital. The second way we do it is we will purchase a property from a third party and we will look to um, uh, avoid having to pay transfer taxes, minimize transaction costs, we would acquire that property from the third party on behalf of the operator and immediately enter into a lease on a long-term basis. And then third is we do build to suits. And we've done a number of these where we will acquire actually a piece of land and we will provide the capital for the operator to build that um, to build that facility and ultimately move into it. We've done that for dispensaries and for cultivation facilities. Anthony, you want to go ahead and ask something? Yeah, I was go going ahead. to say, I mean, you're, you've got a pretty impressive resume. I mean, obviously, you're at JP Morgan for 14 years. I mean, I know the first time we spoke, you'd rifled off several different positions um, within the firm. Um, I mean, why cannabis? Like, why did you, like, what attracted yeah. you to cannabis? Why did you decide to dive into cannabis? And I mean, how did you find the space? Yeah, it's... Um so it goes back to why did I ever leave JP Morgan? I, I, I realized that over the course of my career uh, leading into and then through JP Morgan, I was growing various businesses inside of other larger organizations. And I decided I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. I left JP Morgan in 2011 yeah. to start up a residential mortgage company that had a, a what was a unique focus at the time. And we were able to 
acquire a platform in the Southeast, use that platform to implement our business plan. We scaled it up nationally and we sold it to Blackstone. And so what we saw for the mortgage company, I was looking for in the next venture. And it was the opportunity to find a business model that had... um, that had a lack of institutional capital going after it and a lack of sophistication right. that created some white space to get some uh, outsized returns for investors. And we saw that around the cannabis space. What we figured was institutional capital won't play in this space for some time. So we had the opportunity to bring professionalism, bring the experience to the industry, provide quality capital, but also a really solid return to our investors. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, I mean, you, do you see do you see this playbook rolling out again? Um, I mean, in in terms of like selling the book on a on a go forward basis down the road to someone like a Blackstone, because um, I mean, I've always been a proponent that these the REITs are an integral part of of the investment thesis in this space. And once we all keep talking about institutional money, but I mean, once that hits, I mean, the plant touching businesses are great, but if I'm an institution, I'm going straight for the real estate books. Um, yeah, for, from an investing perspective. Yeah, good point. It, it certainly could be a path. I mean, here's what I'd say is that we look to maximize returns for investors. It's that if that's the path that maximizes returns for investors, then we'll take it. But when I think about their interest in the sector, I actually look at many other subsectors within real estate, whether it be cold storage or whether it be cell towers. There are these sub-segments within real estate, and we think cannabis real estate is just another sub-segment. And in those sub-segments, you'll find that there are usually a handful of companies that dominate that sector. And in some cases, you do see a Blackstone stepping in or or big name, big asset managers like that because they want to have exposure to that sub-sector. So we think that there is room for a couple of us to dominate the cannabis sector. Um, And then ultimately, if it's best for our shareholders, Holders will look for an exit, but that's certainly not necessary. Yeah. Anthony, who's some of the notable names that you've worked with within the industry? Oh, in our portfolio, we have some of the top names in the industry, like a Cure Leaf or a Cresco, a True Leave, an Air Strategies, a Columbia Care. Those are some of the public names. But we also have hmm. some of the private, some of, in our opinion, some of the better private names out there um, that we don't always talk about as much because people aren't as familiar with them. But whether it be a C3 Industries or a Mint Cannabis or a Greenlight, um, We think that we've got a a really good slate of tenants and um, we're excited to work with them. Is there anything that you could share with our audience that goes into the underwriting process um, on the tenants? I mean, are you more so market specific when you're selecting what to uh, what to underwrite property wise or is it more so the tenant, what they've done in their track record um, from a from a nationwide perspective? I'd say all of that is is in there. Um, what we like to explain is we focus on three core facets of the, of our underwriting. One is uh, the property itself. Two is going to be the jurisdiction where the property is located, and three is going to be um, the management team and, and the management team's capability. So let me peel that back a little bit for you. So when yeah, we talk about the talk about the jurisdiction, we think that that is a significant predictor of risk. We like to focus on limited license jurisdictions. This yeah. is where there are limited licenses, which makes a better operating environment for our tenant, meaning better margins. Um, but it also provides us the belief that 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 license is worth something to somebody. So if our tenant can't make it, then they will find a place for that license. And we've seen that happen in limited okay. license jurisdictions. Whereas um, when we look at the property itself, we want to make sure the property is actually, we're in at a right basis. We're in um, at a level where the property can provide cash flow sufficient to pay rent. Um, we want to make sure that the property is in a in an area where there might be an alternative use. We have some properties. A lot of the cultivation properties are inside what I'd call the loop around a major metro area, like in in Phoenix or outside of Boston um, or outside of Chicago, as some examples. And then lastly, it's about the management team. We want to make sure that the management team knows how to run a high growth business in a highly regulated environment, but also that they have the ability to raise institutional capital. I think everybody knows that these businesses have a voracious appetite for capital. And it's really important to know that your tenant can go out and attract institutional capital because a lot of people can raise money, friends and family, but getting the institutional size capital in is another game and is critically important to the longevity of some of these businesses. Yeah. 
Anthony, how much was it an influence with your background working at JP Morgan to establish relationships with names that investors know in this space, like the air wellnesses of the world? Like how, how is like, how much of an influence was that? And how were you able, I guess, over time to like, you know, develop those relationships with them? Yeah, I, I think that when when I look back at G, my time at JP Morgan and and we were there before the crisis, during the crisis, we had a very large book to to work through after the 2008 crisis hit. What I learned is that quality management teams with quality business plans tend to survive. Um, they yep. tend to be able to make it through difficult periods. We always knew from when we started this business in early 2019, we always knew there was going to be a difficult period. We never believed it yep. was a straight line up. And so we wanted to make sure that we had that perspective in looking at companies. And so when you look at the professionals that run companies like Air, as you mentioned, or Columbia Care, uh, recently raising capital today, which I think is a smart move. I understand why some people might be upset for the dilution, but to bolster the balance sheet. Like we're looking for management teams that can make those types of decisions um, to, to balance all the variables. Um, and so, you know, that's why we do business with those companies, but it's also what we look for in the private companies because it's not just public yeah. companies that have those qualities. Which I think a lot of people are learning more and more about as they, uh, you know, follow this industry more and more. But the reason I bring that up is that, as you said, like your company's uh, income positive and you produce a quarterly dividend, which you announced earlier this week, which is something that we don't hear that often in that space. And it's music to a lot of uh, cannabis investors ears, dividend and uh, cannabis. It's something a lot of our viewers come out and reach out and, you know, will ask, like, do you think a lot of companies will provide this in the future? remains to be seen, but you're now providing that now. So walk us through how you're able to provide that. Well, like I said, most public companies uh, do not offer that at this time. Right. As a real estate investment trust or REIT, um, we are mandated the, the, the REIT formation structure requires you to distribute 90 over 90% of your net income. And so again, I go back to our business model. Business model is pretty straightforward. We acquire properties, we rent them out on a long-term basis. And so every month we're collecting rent. We take the rental income, we have expenses to run the company. I tell you that, you know, compare our expenses to others in the space, both lenders and real estate companies. I believe we have one of the lowest expense ratios out there. We're, we're fairly prudent in how we spend our investors' money and what's left over the net operating income, NOI, or in our case, you would call that AFFO, Available Funds from Operations. We distribute between 80 and 90% of that out to, um, out to our shareholders. We, as a corporation, don't pay tax under the REIT structure. So we're wow. able to shield some of that income for our investors. The investors will pay tax on the dividend once they receive it, but it's one level of taxation. So it's an added benefit um, to our shareholders. Wow. Interesting to say, at least. I can't help but feel the private side, if we get reform, how much business growth opportunity there's going to be pertaining to that across the country, right? Yes, yes, for sure. I think I think there are some unbelievably quality operators that are in this industry, and we see yes. it state to state to state. We see it where, um, in Arizona, as an example, we have a tent in Arizona that's doing really, really well. There are other people we hear in Arizona that are closing down because they cannot that, that they can't make it. Yeah. And I think what this highlights is where cannabis is no different than any other industry. It comes down to business plan strategy and execution. Yep. And so if you yep. have a solid business plan with a good strategy and solid execution, you're generally going to um, be able to win in this sector. And I think we're seeing that play yep. out state by state. Interesting. Um, yeah, what would you uh, what, what would you tell a retail investor that was looking into REITs um, from an investment perspective on like how to evaluate question. these companies? Because I mean, the plant touching businesses, they're relatively easy. Um, they're relatively easy to comprehend. They're relatively easy to to fundamentally analyze. But I mean, REITs, I mean, it, it does get into some high finance like semantics when you're looking through earnings reports and looking through the businesses. Like where would you sit, think is a good uh, place to start if you were going to evaluate the various REITs in the cannabis space? I think you start at the portfolio. I think you look at the quality of the names in the portfolio because what we like to say is, it's a lot easier to do a deal than it is to collect rent for 15 or 20 years. And in order for us to be yeah. successful, we need to continue to collect rent on a regular basis. So the first place to start right. is looking at the quality of the portfolio and making an assessment on those organizations, those tenants' ability to really be there for 15 years and be able to pay the rent. Next, 
I would look at um, uh, I would look at the expense ratio, right? Because that is the investor's money. How much are you paying that management team to execute that business strategy? And then there's differences. Some people are internally managed. Some people are externally managed. We chose to be internally managed, meaning we only work for um, for our shareholders. I'm not criticizing the external management model. It's a different model. There's base fees and incentive fees, but understanding if your manager is an external manager, if you have internally managed platform and what people are spending, um, in order to manage the portfolio and generate that ROI, because we can get a 12% top line yield, but if we're spending seven points of that, uh, in expenses, well, your net is much lower. The, the less we spend internally on expenses, the more that goes through to our investors in available funds from operations or AFFO. And have you seen have you seen traditional rates? Like, for instance, like everyone's fixated on where the Fed's going with rates. Like, have those rates impacted the business at all? Because I mean, I know like traditionally cannabis spreads have traded at a premium um, yes. when you're talking about the coupons that are on these properties. So, I mean, how, has that impacted the business, if if any? It certainly has. Um, what you've seen is for the top operators in the industry, I would say a year ago or before the Fed started its rate hiking cycle, they were starting to expect um, cap rates in the 9% range. That's what they were demanding when we were having negotiations. I'm not saying we ever, we ever did those deals, but that's what they were demanding. Yeah. Now, though, when you've had this Fed tightening cycle, oh, well, well, let's just say if it was net 9% in a world where rates were so low, you could think about that risk premium that represented yeah. to get to the 9%. Now that rates have come up so much, you think about that same risk premium, it's just naturally going to move, uh, move rates higher. But what's really interesting about this industry is I could run mathematical models that would tell you, oh, the cap rate should be a 14% or a 15% because of the risk premium over where the 10-year is. But the reality is you have to start thinking about the stress on the business if they have to yeah. pay that much for their capital. Now, maybe we're all moving to a world like it was 25 or 30 years ago where the cost of capital is much, much higher. And businesses did operate with 15% uh, coupons yeah. on the debt uh, or, or cap rates. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're actually going to go there. Um, but that's yeah. how it's impacted it, Anthony. It's, it's definitely moved up where the execution would be because that cost of capital is just more expensive today. Yeah. So this is good. Like I see this dividend uh, that you announced uh, earlier this week. It works out to be 39 cents per share for the third quarter, which matches the dividend for the second quarter. Uh, in your history as a public company as well, the dividend has never gone down. Can you explain why that is? Yeah, we continue to grow our portfolio. Well, well, first off, I think we have a solid portfolio of tenants and a solid portfolio of properties that have quality um, EBITDA coverages. EBITDA yep. is EBITDA plus rent. So there's cash flow coverage at the property. And that's important because that's your predictor of being able to pay the rent. And so our tenants are paying the rent. We continue to, to receive that cash flow. We're managing expense as well. And then we're growing. We continue to put money out. And today we're putting money out for, for two projects, one in Missouri and one in Arizona. And so as we continue yes. to put money out, we continue to grow our revenue and grow our available funds from operations or AFFL. From so, a, uh, I guess from, from an asset and from an investment perspective, I mean, are you, do you prefer to invest, let's say in vertical, in vertical companies? Do you prefer to invest in cultivation, retail? Um, is there like a bread and butter that you look for? Or it's, it's basically on a case by case basis as it relates to the assets as well as the opco. We like both cultivation and dispensaries um, and the retail assets. And in fact, we've got uh, 17 dispensaries in the portfolio today and 15 cultivation um, properties in the portfolio. So we do like both. Um, in terms of do we have a preference for um, putting capital out to cultivation, what I would say there is your capital goes out quicker when you do cultivation. You know, If you looked at it by capital, we have over 90% of our capital is in cultivation. You can see less than 50% of the properties. They're just chunkier assets. Um, and so when we're looking for those, um, we don't have necessarily a preference. We, we look at all of it, um, but that does get you the growth faster. Let's, uh, I want to focus too on, in addition to the dividends, the repurchase package, you originally authorized a $10 million share repurchase package, which was last November and executed the repurchase of over 700,000 shares, which amounted to like $9.3 million. And now you've announced an additional 
$10 million share buyback authorization. So when I look at this, why do you see, I guess, the value to deploy capital and repurchase shares now as opposed to uh, deploying capital elsewhere? Yeah, you know, first I would I would say it's important to us to make sure we're good stewards of our investors' capital, right? That is that is yeah. our job and that is our duty to our investors. Um, there are some reasons that we believe are more technical in nature, particularly around custody, that we think are limiting um, the price on our stock and keeping us, in our opinion, artificially low relative to where we think the value is. And so we understand that some investors need to exit at those prices, whatever's going on in their world or they, their perspectives. But when they're leaving that much value on the table, we feel like we should be there to pick it up for our investors. And, and we have a choice. We could either do a new transaction in cannabis or we could buy back shares. And so we're always looking at the return to our investors by putting out capital versus buying back the shares. And this buyback isn't to say we don't think there's an opportunity in cannabis. We continue to be very um, focused on executing and doing more deals in cannabis. But when you look at the return that was available to buy back our stock on average below $13 a share, it was way too compelling to yeah. leave on the table. Um, and so if more yeah. investors are going to exit at those low levels, you know, we'll be there to uh, make those accretive purchases on behalf of our shareholders. Um, you guys get a lot of feedback on comparisons with IIPR, which trades in the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Yes, I see do. a lot of similarities with business models, right? Go ahead. Sorry. No, yes, we do. We get a lot of comparisons. We are uh, very similar in, in, well, we're exactly the same in terms of focusing on sale leasebacks in the cannabis sector. I think we have a different approach than they do, um, but by and large, it's the same business model. So last thing, as we said, is just we're bringing this home and recapping this. So dividend announcement, you're increasing dividends, as you said, at 39 cents per share. Um, I, I, I'm curious to learn more about, you know, as time progresses, as we get reform as to how this industry does, uh, you know, grow, for example, uh, pertaining to real estate. But I think one thing that I think a lot of investors need to be mindful of is just the growth opportunity when it comes to REITs within this industry, when it pertains to the private sector, which I can't help but feel like there's going to be a huge growth opportunity pertaining to that. Yes. I, I think that, um, I think the number of public companies in this sector is kind of set for a while. I don't see IPOs happening. If anything, right. if there happens to be a merger, maybe you're going to see a couple either fall away because uh, they can't be public anymore. They don't have enough scale. They're not successful enough, or maybe one or two get together. Um, so I think what we're likely to see in this next phase of growth is more of that private company growth, um, in addition to the public companies yeah. being able to you know scale up their businesses. But I think you know we've already seen a number of people pull together capital over the last twelve months, looking to pull together um, and pull together distressed companies and do a bit of a roll up, a distressed roll up, to find on the other side that they've got a portfolio of five or six states that were formerly distressed companies, but they've done a nice job in um, in writing those ships and getting those uh, those companies operating well. Yeah. Well, I think the big thing too is just people are really starting to understand the roadmap as to how this industry is going to grow and um, what that pertains to, you know, in the event, like I said, if we do get reform. But needless to say, always great to have people on that are obviously are leading, you know, the respective verticals within the actual industry. But, you know, this is the first of many conversations, but we want to learn obviously more like how the real estate model does come to fruition and advance, um, you know, not only today, but as we, uh, you know, obviously see a lot of change that happens within the industry as far as interest over the next three to six months. So listen, keep in touch and uh, let's have this conversation again. And uh, any questions that people want to ask pertaining to this for, uh, space and related to real estate, let us know, leave a comment below, provide any feedback. We'll reach out to Anthony with any questions that you want answered. Uh, appreciate the time and let's keep in touch. Thanks a lot, guys. I really enjoyed it. Really appreciate you having me on. Thanks yep, a lot, Andrew. Bye-bye. What's up, everyone? So what'd you think of the interview? Are there any more questions you want us to ask that you want to learn more of? Then leave a comment below and let us know what you think. As usual, share this video with your network, smash that like button, and most importantly, subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.